Hey guys, the Uniformed Historian here. Thanks for taking a few minutes of your time to join me this evening. Um, I wanted to do a different video this evening. I wanted to talk about the Civil War in Jackson County, West Virginia. Now, a lot of times you'll hear me say that Marmette is my hometown, and I'll always stand by that. Most of my earliest memories are in Marmette. However, I actually spent most of my life in Jackson County, West Virginia, growing up on a farm in Kenna, a little unincorporated area. And so, for all intents and purposes, I'm a Jackson County boy at heart. So, I thought, why not talk a little bit about myself by talking a little bit about my county during the Civil War and how it was split and how it was loyal to each side and ultimately what my thoughts are about Jackson County and the Civil War. So without further ado, let's get started talking a little bit about the early days of Jackson County. Jackson County, or what became Jackson County, I should say, was surveyed originally by George Washington, our first president of these United States. Uh, the county itself was formed in 1831 from parts of Mason, Kanawha, and Wood counties, and I always thought this was kind of interesting. Jackson County was named for Andrew Jackson, one of our early presidents, but he was a Democrat, and politically speaking, Jackson County historically has leaned Republican except for a couple of presidential elections. I believe they voted for Johnson, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and I know that they voted for Bill Clinton twice in recent years. However, that's a discussion about modern politics for another day. But I just always thought that was interesting that Jackson County was named after a Democratic president, but politically they tend to lean Republican. So anyway, moving on. Um, a little bit more about Jackson County. In the 1860 census, the population of Jackson County is listed as 8,306 people. 55 people are slaves. Now, of those 55 slaves, only two are located in Ripley, West Virginia, and they were the property of a Mr. Greg Ayers. I don't know how many of you all have been to Jackson County. I know a lot of people watching this are probably from Jackson County, so you're going to know what I'm talking about here. But Jackson County does not have a lot of fertile growing soil. We've got that daggone red clay mud, and it sticks to everything, and you can't get it off your shoes. I mean, you can hose your shoes off ten times. That stuff's not coming off. My mama used to get so upset with me and dad coming into the house if we didn't knock our shoes off well enough because our house would get filthy from this red clay mud. And you can't grow anything in it except maybe hay. So as you can see, you know, the soil here does not really make farming that profitable, which means hence slavery is not that profitable. Hence, there's only 55 slaves in Jackson County and two of them are located in the city of Ripley. Now, mostly unincorporated towns comprise Jackson County, uh, places like Millwood, Fair Plain, Goldtown, Kenna, where I grew up, Gibbon, Kentuck, Sandyville, Evan. Um, Ravenswood and Ripley are the two incorporated cities, and we're, ooh, that's the big town now. Um, but Ravenswood is the larger of those two cities, but Ripley is the county seat. Now, Early on, when Jackson County was first formed, Ravenswood and Ripley both wanted that title of being the county seat of Jackson County. Uh, they went back and forth a whole lot about it, and finally an independent commission appointed by the Virginia General Assembly got together, and they determined that Ripley should be the county seat. Uh, a lot of the argument there was that Ravenswood was too close to the Ohio River. Uh, Ripley had their points for wanting it to be there, but ultimately Ripley won that battle, so they are still the county seat of Jackson County even today. And ever since that, Ripley and Ravenswood, there's been tension there ever since that's happened. Ever since that day, we've <laughs> basically hated each other. There's even a high school rivalry between Ripley and Ravenswood, but that's going to be later on in this video. So anyway, now during the Civil War, we're going to fast forward from the early 1830s to the 1860s. Uh, Jackson County was split during the Civil War. However, I feel that if I had to give it to one side or the other, just, you know, white and black, red and blue, one and two, if I had to just pick one, I would probably hand Jackson County as a Union County. Now, there's a few reasons that I do feel this way. The main reason that I feel this way is because the 9th West Virginia Infantry, which was a Union regiment, 
they had more Jackson Countyans enlisted in their ranks than any other regiment in the Civil War, North or South. And I feel that speaks a lot about the politics of the county, at least as far as where most people felt their loyalties lied, and that's how they enlisted, at least at least that's what I see with that picture, is that more people in Jackson County joined the 9th West Virginia Infantry, a Union regiment, than any other regiment in the war. And you got to remember, counties, uh, states, towns, people enlisted together. So it wasn't like, you know, you had one person here, one person from there, one person from here, and they all, you know, went from all over the globe and found themselves in different regiments and so on. No, everybody from communities came together and formed a company, and then that town and that town and that town and so on came together to form regiments. So you see how everybody was from the same area. So now let's back up just a little bit, uh, talking about Ripley and Ravenswood. That's going to be the main focus of this video is those two cities as they are the two most populated areas in the county. Ripley received its charter from the Virginia General Assembly on December 19, 1832. Huh, oh wait, that's today. Happy birthday, Ripley. That's the whole reason I wanted to do this video today. It was Ripley's birthday. Now, initially, it was not called Ripley. It was originally called Jackson Courthouse. Later, the post office was simply called Jackson, and it was finally renamed a third time and for the final time after Harry S. Ripley, who was a minister who drowned in Mill Creek. And the saddest part of this story is when his body was recovered from the creek, they found a marriage license inside his pocket for himself and the woman that he was about to marry. So he died before they could get married, and I'm sure she was devastated. Now, Ravenswood, on the other hand, it was named for a poem by a Scotsman, Sir Walter Scott. It's called, When the Last Laird of Ravenswood Shall Ride. And this is a very short poem, so I'm actually going to read it to you. It goes... When the last laird of Ravenswood to Ravenswood shall ride, and woo a dead maiden to be his bride, he shall stable his steed in the Kelpie's flow, and his name shall be lost forevermore. And that's how Ravenswood got its name after that poem that was written. Now, Ravenswood tended to favor the Union while Ripley tended to favor the Confederacy. Now, I've talked with other people that have said that they've heard it other ways. They've heard you know this and that, and that each town had a, a faction uh, of one way or the other. And the, honestly, all of these stories are true because there are very few primary source documents that I've been able to locate, um, myself at least. If you found any, I would love to see them. Please share them with me. Um, I've not found too many primary source documents that can plainly state that Ravenswood was Union for this reason, Ripley was Confederate for this reason or whatever. So I'm going to tell you all all the clues that I had to piece together to make this determination on my own. So let's start with the early part of the Civil War in April 1861. The 17th Ohio Infantry was the first Union regiment that enters Jackson County. And you got to remember, this was still a part of Virginia at the time. There was no West Virginia regiment. This was all star part of, still part of Virginia. Now, in Ravenswood, even before the war, there was a man by the name of Daniel Frost, who actually was the highest-ranking Union officer to emerge from Jackson County, West Virginia. He was living in Ravenswood as early as 1850, operating a wharf boat. And he actually published a newspaper there, the Virginia Chronicle, which he purchased from his brother William in 1858, I believe it was. And just look around, folks. You know what the media does. You know how media influences your opinions on things. Uh, Fox News. People watch Fox News and they automatically associate you with being a Republican. If you watch CNN or MSNBC or something, they automatically associate you with being a Democrat. Same thing because that's what their opinions are. So if that's the news source that you subscribe to, that's probably the way your opinion might be swayed a little bit. So you've got this man that became a very high-ranking union officer producing a news newspaper even before the war, he's not going to be spreading secession propaganda in that area. You're going to have a stronger Union contingent reading this newspaper. Now, jumping over to Ripley for just a moment, 
Ripley became the headquarters of Henry Wise during the Battle of Scare Creek, Virginia in 1861. He was a former governor of Virginia, and a lot of people didn't like this guy. I'm, I'm told that sometimes even his own son didn't like him. He was a real jerk. Um, but he was there as early as July 1861, and he issued the following proclamation to the town and to the county, and I'm going to read it here for you. I'm sorry, I didn't take the time to memorize all of this, so bear with me. Ripley, Virginia, July 6, 1861. To the true and loyal citizens of Virginia on all the Ohio border, and more particularly to those of Jackson County. I would earnestly appeal to come to the defense of the Commonwealth, invaded and insulted as she is by a ruthless and unnatural enemy. None need be afraid that they will be held accountable for past opinions, votes, or acts under the delusions which have been practiced upon Northwestern people if they will now return to their patriotic duty and acknowledge their allegiance to Virginia and her Confederate states as their true and lawful sovereigns. You were Union men, so was I. And we held a right to be so until oppression and invasion and war drove us to the assertion of a second independence. The sovereign state proclaimed it by her convention and by a majority of more than 100,000 votes at the polls. She has seceded from the old and established a new confederacy. She has commanded and we must obey her voice. I come to execute her command, to hold out the olive branch to her true and peaceful citizens, to repel invasion from abroad and subdue treason only at home. Come to the call of the country which owes you protection as her native sons. Henry A. Wise, Brigadier General. So he was a pretty powerful speaker, and it's pretty clear what his intentions are. Um, so moving on from Henry Wise, being in Ripley in 1861, he's got that early Confederate influence in the town, while you have Daniel Frost in Ravenswood with his early Union influence. So that's where I think that whole argument initially comes from, but we're going to get into more as things go on. There was a sheriff. His name was William Greer, and he was known to have Confederate sympathies, and his brother, John M. Greer, served as his deputy and also apparently shared his political principles. He claimed to remain a loyal Unionist, but later he was elected the sheriff, and there was a special act of the legislature that had to happen, had to be passed, and it had to be removed from his record that he was a suspected secessionist before he could even serve as the sheriff. So if you can imagine, you know, it, even if you're a, a union man and you're at home and you know that your local sheriff is running around enforcing the law as he sees it, you're not exactly going to paint yourself up as a union man and fly the flag proudly out front when you know that's just going to make you a target for law enforcement. So I think that's another reason that Jackson County is sometimes perceived as being a Confederate county because there weren't too many people that wanted to be marked as Union men because your law enforcement and your city officials in Ripley were Confederate sympathizers. Another interesting occurrence that happens on December 19th happens in 1861. There's actually a group of irregulars known as the Moccasin Rangers, which I have talked about in the past and done actually a couple different videos on them. Um, they raided Ripley on December 19th, 1861, and this band consisted of about 16 people that was led by the 52-year-old Captain Daniel Dusky, and he claimed his authority because he had been elected an officer in a Virginia militia unit before all this. So that's how he manages to appoint himself captain of this uh, group of misfits. Now, this whole incident gave me a giant clue as to which side the citizens would have favored in Ripley. There was a man by the name of Dr. O.G. Chase who came to Ripley to organize a group of Union men to form a company for a regiment in the Civil War fighting for the North. Um, he did not trust the local citizens, so he got his men, and he had them lock up all the weapons that belonged to all the local people in the area that he believed were secessionists. They locked him in the jail and the post office, and then he threatened them that if they were molested in any way, they would pay dearly. And then he marches his men off to Cottageville to drill, but then he actually keeps on going uh, someplace in Mason County, I believe he ended up. But point is, he leaves the citizens defenseless, and then 
in the evening of December 19, 1861, Dan Dusky rides in with his moccasin rangers on horseback. They're shooting, they're hooping and hollering, giving the rebel yell. And there were about 16 men that came into town, and they included Captain Daniel Dusky and his son, George Dusky, Alex Groff, Marcellus J. Kester, Thomas Goff, Jacob Varner, Ben Wright, Ephraim B. Carter, George W. Tanner, George Gibson, and there's three other people who are not named. They are – we never did figure out exactly who those individuals were that participated in this raid. But during the raid um, – Daniel Dusky and Jacob Varner tried to access the post office, but the postmaster, John Wetzel, refused to open it. And there's a very famous incident that happens from this. Uh, Dan Dusky gets up in front of the post office door, and he famously proclaims, well, I have a key that will unlock any door, and he proceeded to kick down the door to the post office. Now, the post office where it sits today is not where the post office was at this point in time. It was actually closer. Uh, I believe it's North Street. Someone will probably have to correct me on that, but it's over close to the library, say National Bank, like further over in that block. It's not where it sits today. Um, but during this raid, they took a whole bunch of weapons. Uh, there was a man that actually held a young boy at gunpoint and forced him to open up his father's tobacco shop, so they made away with a lot of tobacco supplies as well. And they made their way back into Roan County, where there was a raid later on by Union soldiers who captured a lot of these guys. And uh, two of them were actually captured, uh, Daniel Dusky and Jacob Varner. Now, the other guys, yeah, they technically could have held them as criminals uh, on, you know, I guess, destruction of property, you know, disturbing the peace, that sort of thing. But even in 1862, or 1861, I mean, messing with the mail, uh -uh, that was a no-no. You didn't do that. Daniel Dusky and Jacob Varner were arrested on federal charges of robbing the mail, and they were put on trial. And they were held as criminals because they were not enlisted soldiers in the Confederate Army. They were both found guilty and they were sent to prison, but later they were exchanged for two Union officers, but not before President Abraham Lincoln had to pardon them in order for them to be legally exchanged. And there's actually a really famous drawing of Dan Dusky meeting with West Virginia's Governor Arthur I. Borman while he was in captivity. Um, they had known each other before the war. And uh, just as a side note here, uh, the governor, Governor Borman, he hated guerrillas. He hated irregulars. He had no sympathy for them, and he didn't have too many kind words to say to Dan Dusky while he was in captivity. So um, just to give you a, a couple of examples of other things that happened in Ripley and how the locals suffered a little bit. Um, things were kind of quiet for a lot of 1862 in Ripley. Um, the main thing that happens is in fall of 1862, I believe it was in September, uh, Albert Gallatin Jenkins and his Confederate cavalry ride into Ripley and they uh, – shall we say, relieved a federal paymaster of several thousand dollars and forced him to exchange money with the Confederates for their Confederate scrip versus the federal greenbacks. So he was not a happy man. And they also made away with a couple of suits of clothes and some Union uniforms and that sort of thing. And then General Jenkins rides on into Ravenswood, crosses the river, uh, loses a horse that drowns in the river, and he gets credited with being the first Confederate general to carry the Confederate battle flag into Ohio. Um, now, some of the citizens in Ripley, um, I've read that – okay, let me back up just for a second here and point something out. Most of everything that I've told you before now, I actually can point to original documents to say this is how we know this happened. A lot of the stories that I'm about to tell you are more uh, – orally passed down, should we say. Um, they are not something that I can point to a letter and say this is – where we get this from, this is where we get that from. Um, these have been passed down orally, so there might be a couple of details that have been mixed up or somebody's forgotten something over time when they wrote it down. But these are just some examples of how divided Jackson County was during the Civil War. Now, there was a man by the name of Jack Hall. He was a crippled mail carrier, and he lived in the Ripley area. Um, he was suspected of providing information to Union soldiers in the region, so some Confederate soldiers under the command of Captain Virgil Armstrong of Ripley, uh, they searched his home, and he hid in the shrubbery in his yard until the soldiers left. 
Interesting thing, though, is Captain Armstrong later claimed that he saw Mr. Hall hiding, but he didn't let it be known because he knew that he was innocent. He hadn't actually passed anything along. They'd been neighbors for a really long time. Now, Henry Casto, who was also a relative of Jack Hall, I believe he was a brother-in-law or something, um, he was held as a prisoner of the Confederates in Ripley at the Shields home. Um, he was laying down on the floor as if he was asleep when his guard that was watching over him went into the hall. Uh, there was ammunition being passed out because they thought they were about to be attacked by Unionists in the area, and that's when Mr. Casto made his way out the back door, got across Mill Creek, and he hid out in a field for a week. Think about that. You went out and hid in a field for a week while the Hall family sneaks food to you. That's how terrified this guy was for his life. Now, another interesting story, um, the McGrew Hood Grist Mill. Um, it, it was actually located just past where the fire department sits today. There's a, a creek there. You drive across a bridge if you're going through town. Um, that's where that was located. Um, and there's a couple of interesting stories that happened there, and there's actually a sign at the courthouse that tells you a little bit more in depth about this. I'm just going to gloss over it a little bit. Um, there was a mill near that bridge um, known as the McGrew Hood Grist Mill, and a small detachment of Union soldiers came to the mill and dumped about 30 barrels of flour below the mill onto the rocks to prevent Confederates from getting it. Uh, they threatened to destroy the entire mill, but the owner, Mr. Hood, um, he talked them out of it. He begged them not to you know, burn it down or chop it up or whatever they were planning to do with it. And so they actually took pity on the man and they didn't completely destroy it, but they did break the crosshead of the steam engine that was used to run it when the water was low. So it could be repaired and he could use it later, but they knew the Confederates weren't going to be getting anything anytime soon from it. Uh, the Confederates uh, took Mr. Hood to their camp at Grasslick as a prisoner of war, and uh, he was soon released after that, though. So this poor guy just gets it both ways. Now, Ripley after the war. Um, once the war ends in 1865, everybody returns home. There's you know mixed feelings, and uh, there's a lot of instances uh, like the Barnett family I've heard. Um, there's two branches of the Barnetts. One spells their name with an E, and the other one spells it without an E on the end, and apparently... That comes about as part of the Civil War because one side fought for the Union, one side fought for the South, and they did not want to claim each other. So if you're a Barnett and you're watching this, there's a good chance that your family was split during the Civil War if you're from Jackson County. Uh, in 1915, uh, there was a Union Soldiers Monument dedicated outside the Ripley Courthouse, and Judge George W. Atkinson delivered the dedication address, and it was attended by thousands of citizens uh, because this Judge Atkinson was a really popular guy. Uh, now, today, Ripley and Ravenswood are still in each other's throats. Um, the Ravenswood Red Devils and the Ripley Vikings have played the hatchet game for years and years, and it's actually really sad that uh, this year they have decided to discontinue that game for the foreseeable future. Uh, it's not anybody's fault or anything, it's just that Ravenswood, their size, um, their, their level has dropped and they've become so much smaller than Ripley, and it's just not a fair contest anymore. So until something changes, they've just kind of agreed that they're not going to play the game until things get more even. So I believe Jackson County's new rival is going to be Roan County, but that, that's another video for another day. Um, now... To tell you just how serious this rivalry is, and uh, I hope he doesn't mind that I'm telling you all this, um, if you think about rivalries in sports, you know, you think about, you know, like the Red Sox and the Yankees, you think about the Cardinals and the Cubs, the Reds and the Pirates, you know, it, uh, you can tell I'm a baseball fan, obviously. Um, you think of rivalries like, like that, but in West Virginia, high school football is a big thing. This rivalry is so serious that one of my closest mentors and one of my most favorite people in the world, uh, Mr. Landis, he was my sixth grade math teacher, he boasts that he has never owned a red shirt. And to this day, he will not wear a red shirt because Ravenswood Red Devils 
are the red and black and Ripley High School is blue and white. And that's actually where I graduated from. So shameless plug here, go Vikings! So um, it's a very serious rivalry and I'm sure he's not the only person that has something like that to talk about. So um, I'm going to try to keep this a little bit short uh, this evening because I was going to do this live and I just had some things come up with my Facebook live feed and I'm not really able to do it live. But I do want to give a quick shout out to some folks that have helped me with gathering up these stories and uh, gathering up the facts behind them. Um, Miss Barnett, or she'll always be Miss Barnett to me, Adina Barnett. Um, she's one of the teachers at Ripley High School. She was one of my advisors while I was there. What, great lady, great friend of mine. Um, Brian Casto, he's one of my cousins. He's done a lot of research. He's a big time history nerd as well. Uh, Dr. Michael Chancy, who now lives up in the Martinsburg area of West Virginia. Uh, Dr. Philip Hatfield, he's done a lot of research on the 13th West Virginia, and there were a lot of 13th guys from Jackson County. Um, matter of fact, one of them I got to visit this uh, this past fall up in uh, Winchester, Virginia, uh, James Knox Polk Parsons. He's actually buried in Winchester National Cemetery. He was shot and killed at the Battle of Cedar Creek, and he, he's buried up there. He's a Jackson County boy. Um, but Dr. Hatfield helped me with finding some information as well. And I also want to give a special shout out to Mike Rubin and the Jackson County Historical Society for providing me with a lot of research materials to make this video. I really appreciate your help. And uh, one last thing that I want to mention um, before, actually two things I want to mention beforehand. Um, I want to backtrack a little bit because I did a video um, from Angerona, West Virginia in Jackson County on George B. Crow. Um, I found something today on him that I really wish I would have found before I made my video at his house. I actually found a story about how he got into the Confederate service. Um, he was actually at his home. He was only 17 at the time. He was at his home in Angerona, and he saw a whole bunch of Confederate soldiers riding past his house going out towards Cottageville, and uh, towards Ravenswood areas because they heard that there was a Union contingency in the area and they were going to be attacking. So this man comes riding up to the house and says, hey, the Yankees are coming. You better get your stuff together and you know get ready to fight. So he runs inside and grabs a squirrel gun. And these are his own words, mind you. I'm just paraphrasing. But he goes in and gets a squirrel gun. Hops on a horse and starts to ride, you know, after these guys that are going towards the Union soldiers. And on his way there, he's intercepted by another soldier who says, you know, whoa, 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 hold on. Where do you think you're going? You're just a kid. You've you know, not had any training. You're not enlisted. You know, you're not able to do this here. You go back here and help us by watching these horses. Now, I did mention that he was moving horses for the Confederacy to prevent confiscation, but this is where it really begins. Um, he goes back, you know, this whole mile that he rode from his house um, with these horses so that the soldiers can fight. And when he gets back, there's another soldier that comes up to him and says something to the effect of, you know, hey, buddy, I'm hungry. We've been going since early this morning. Can you get me some food? And so he says, yeah, sure, here, hold these horses. So the guy you know, holds the horses while he goes and gets him food. And when he comes back, um, there's an officer there that, you know, kind of scolds him a little bit because, you know, he left his he left his post. He wasn't following orders. You're not cut out to be a soldier and that sort of thing. But he ends up joining this outfit and he serves with them the rest of the war. And that that's how he uh, got into the Civil War. So I wish I'd known that when I was telling that story at his house, but I thought I would share that with you today. And who knows, maybe sometime I'll do a more in-depth video on Mr. Crow and tell a little bit more of his story because this is a, a constant process. I'm always learning. I'm always finding new things. I never know everything. And if anybody ever finds anything they want to share, I would love to see it. And now the last, last thing that I want to talk about here, um, I've been posting a lot of things about the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation recently, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, haha, <laughs> um, but I do want to point out that I'm doing a fundraiser for them because they're trying to save several hundred acres of Fishers Hill Battlefield now, but they're also trying to save 72 acres of the battlefield at Third Winchester. 
In order to help them raise some money, I enlisted the help of Mr. Patrick Gorman, who portrays General Hood in the movie Gettysburg and Gods and Generals, and he's in a lot of other movies. He's been in uh, some TV shows and that sort of thing as well. And I thought it was very interesting that he performed with Judy Garland at one point. But anyway, um, he was very generous, and he signed this photo for me, and I want this to become yours. So if you will send the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation five dollars that's all i'm asking five bucks if you can send more please do but five bucks is all i'm asking you to send them who who doesn't have five dollars to send um you've got until january 31st i will put a link in the comments below so that you can donate easily if you send me a screenshot or if you want to mail me a check i've had some people do that too message me i'll get you the address um send them five bucks i'll enter you in a drawing and you might get something out of donating that five dollars so it's a win-win situation for everybody involved so i will end the video there thank you very much for joining me this evening i hope you learned something i hope you found this interesting um my voice is starting to go on me so i hope you were able to hear me okay um if you have any stories about Jackson County in the Civil War, or you know something about your ancestors there, uh, please put them in the comments. Send me a message. I would love to hear this stuff from you guys. I'll see you at the next place. Take care and God bless, my friends.